Look around you. The site of this cathedral has been the hub of worshipful life in Chester for perhaps 2,000 years. Tradition has it that on this site stood a Roman temple to Apollo, and around the 7th century AD it was the site of a Saxon church. 200 years later, the church became a shrine, keeping safe the bones of a miracle-working Saxon princess, St. Werburgh. The present building started life in 1092, after the Norman Conquest, as a monastery. This powerful Benedictine abbey housed around 40 monks and was dedicated to St. Werburgh. This abbey survived for four and a half centuries. Then, when Henry VIII destroyed the power of the monasteries, the abbey church lived on, against the odds, as the cathedral we know today. Look then at this great vista of history, down the nave to the east, and consider how these soaring columns and aspiring arches are attempts to celebrate in stone this ancient sacred spot. The baptistry is an appropriate place to start our tour. As you'd expect, you'll see a font, and this is where many a tiny child has become a member of the church. The font is said to be a 7th century wellhead, which Lord Edgerton of Tatton found in Venice. Some think it's a copy, though. Above the font hangs a 17th century lantern, which was found crushed and buried in a garden. Remarkably, all but one of the original horn panels survived the burial. You are now standing near to a Norman arch, built in the so-called Romanesque style. It should be easy to spot because it's rounded, not pointed at the top like the arch on its right. This arch has survived for about a thousand years. It's part of the church erected by the Benedictine monks just after the Norman Conquest. You've reached the vestibule of the monastery, which was where visitors waited outside the chapter house, the business centre of the abbey. Not a bad place to wait on these stone benches under simple Gothic arches, which have survived since 1200 AD. Around then, builders were developing pointed, not rounded arches. This gave them the clue to building higher roofs on more slender pillars. Look into the chapter house, the great Victorian window throws light into this impressive room, called a chapter house because it was where each morning the monks were read a chapter of the rules of St Benedict. These rules covered all aspects of Benedictine life, even down to the sleeping arrangements. Quomodo dormiant monachi. Singuli per singular. Let the brethren sleep singly, each in a separate bed. Let them sleep clothed, but they should not have knives at their side, in case the sleeping are wounded in their dreams. And let not the younger brethren have their beds alongside each other. Mix them with the older monks, so that rising to the work of God, brothers may gently unite against the excuses of the drowsy ones. Henry VIII, the king in the window, quarrelled with the Pope over his right to marry a new queen. He renounced the rule of Rome, founded his own Church of England, and set about destroying the power of the Pope in Britain. As part of this, he pillaged most of the monasteries, gave them as bounty to his supporters, and created many of the ruins we know today. This remarkable little painting is known as the cobweb picture, but in fact it was painted on a net or a web spun by a caterpillar. 
the caterpillar of a silvery white moth from the Tyrol spins its web over the trunk of fruit trees. These wonderful veils can measure up to 30 centimetres wide and a metre long. In the 18th century, there developed a fashion for painting on these webs. It was a delicate and painstaking process, frustrating too, because you couldn't correct mistakes. But, with the aid of the caterpillar, an 18th century artist made this copy of a medieval painting by Lucas Cranach. It's one of very few surviving cobweb pictures anywhere. Look back from the south transept where you now stand to admire the organ. This magnificent instrument is powerful enough to wing praise and prayer to high heaven. The cathedral takes pardonable pride in the organ, built by Whiteley's of Chester in 1876. It has 4,864 pipes and four keyboards full of sound and fury, and both the case and loft are the work of George Gilbert Scott. Now, although the church is cross-shaped, you can see from where you're standing that this south transept is not a mirror image of the north. It's much bigger, the north side being huddled in by the monks' living and working quarters. If you're facing the organ, on your right you will see not one but four south transept chapels which date from as early as the 14th century. There are so many because back then many of the abbey monks ultimately became priests and given that the main purpose of a priest was to say mass, more priests meant that they needed more chapels in which to perform the mass. Quad erat demonstrandum. Apparently, they conducted these services simultaneously in a way we'd find rather strange today. Yesterday's worshippers must have been surrounded by the low rise and fall of priestly voices, hopefully in perpetual harmony. There is something particularly peaceful and protected about the choir. The east window shines above the high altar, the symbolic focus of the services in this great cathedral. Here, congregations throughout the ages have been invited to pray and to worship, and in a word, often describing the services here, to celebrate. And this space, too, gives the cathedral its name. For that three-seater chair, floating free, as it were, from the end of the choir stools, is called the cathedra. It's the impressive seat in which the bishop sits. In these seats, and under these canopies, the monks of St. Werburgh's, and later the dean, clergy and choir of the cathedral, have worshipped for over 600 years. They're still doing it, and all are welcome to come to these services. One of the charming aspects of a medieval church was that it could, perhaps of necessity, contain all of life. So here, the unimaginable richness of decoration is married to a touch of practicality. These highly wrought canopies, for instance, would protect the monks from icy draughts whistling down through the windows, unglazed until the 15th century. They also acted as sounding boards for the plain song, giving a rich resonance to early morning voices of praise. <laughs> Approach the stalls more closely and consider one of the strangest of medieval ideas, of seats that tell a story. Like old cinema seats, the rear seats can be tipped up or down. When they were down, you could sit properly. But when they were tipped up, worshipping monks could still perch their bottoms on the ledges beneath, taking pity on tired legs during the eight daily services. That's why such seats are called misericords, from a Latin word for pity. It was onto these bottoms, of the choir stalls, you understand, that church carpenters couldn't resist carving intricate tales. Now it's time for some detective work. Look hard for the celebrated carving of the elephant and castle. It's on one of the bench ends. The 14th century craftsman had heard about elephants, but had never seen one. But the largest four-legged animal they knew was probably a horse. And this is why the elephant has horse's hooves and the strangest of heads. Note, though, this wasn't just a traveller's tale, for symbolically the elephant represents the church bearing the world upon its back.
This, the Lady Chapel, was the very first part of the ancient church to be rebuilt by the monks, inspired by the new Gothic architecture of the chapter house. Look up to the roof, to the brightly coloured stonework of the ceiling arches. These colours recreate those of the early church, and they remind us that the medieval church was a riot of colour. Remember that these walls would be vivid with murals and wall paintings, illustrating biblical scenes in the lives of the saints. Imagine the gaudiness of a fairground. And then think that to most people of the Middle Ages, with their dark houses and sun-dependent streets, this chapel must have been a brilliant glimpse of heaven on earth. Now look at the reconstructed shrine at the opposite end of the window. This originally held the bones of St. Werburgh, an 8th century princess who was also an abbess and had a reputation for curing ailments through her miracles. St. Werburgh's relics were brought to Chester in the year 907 from their original burial place in Hanbury in Staffordshire. Apparently, they were moved here as protection against the invading Vikings. However, despite the shrine's medieval potency, its Roman Catholic symbols fared badly at times of Reformation and Puritanism. You'll see up at the top that the figures guarding St. Werburgh have been defaced. Look up again to the roof, where the painted ribs intersect. These carvings at the joints are called bosses, and each has a story to tell. Two of them will be very familiar to Christians. The boss nearest to the window depicts the Holy Trinity. In other words, God the Father and Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, symbolised here as a dove. That in the centre shows the Virgin and Child. Mary, the mother of Jesus, holds her baby son in her arms. But closest above the shrine is Becket's boss, so called because it pictures the murder of St Thomas a Becket. St Thomas was the Archbishop of Canterbury, killed in 1170, allegedly on the personal orders of King Henry II. His death created the greatest cult of martyrdom the country has ever seen, and the abbey here at Chester managed to acquire Becket's belt, which proved a great attraction for pilgrims. However, when Henry VIII rejected Rome, he feared that his actions might trigger a new cult of martyrs, so he ordered that all traces of the Becket story should be purged from the surviving churches. But when they came to Chester, the king's men apparently failed to look up, so, Thomas a Becket hung on in there, one of the very few surviving representations of his martyrdom. The monks of St. Werburgh built a house of God in which to retreat from the world and pray for its sins. The south transept is evidence of their uphill task, for all around are the wounds of five centuries of conflict. Look, for instance, at this memorial to the city's HMS Chester and the ship's most famous hero. In one of our more recent wars, that of 1914-18, Jack Cornwall earned the Victoria Cross for bravery. At the tender age of 16, he found himself under pounding attack from four German boats in the Battle of Jutland. Boy Cornwall, a raw recruit, was a sight-setter for the Chester's gun. Although he was mortally wounded at the start of the battle, he stayed at his post under heavy fire, alone by the gun turret, until the very end. After his death and posthumous VC, he became a national legend. The Cornwall Medal is still the highest honour that the Boy Scouts can bestow. But note too how many other boys are mentioned on this memorial plaque. Behind the door at the top of these steps is the Cathedral's Consistory Court. Since 1550, this court has tried cases which concern the life of the Church. It dealt particularly with matters of libel, slander, and moral depravity. Isabella Bradshaw did say of Catherine Ward, Thou art an arrant harlot and a witch, and have done much harm in the country. She did furthermore say... Curate of Weaverham, who did officiate without license, and taught school in church, whereby parishioners were much annoyed by fleas yeah, and lice. The complaint of Thomas Steele contra Morris Gwynn, vicar, for keeping a nurse and a manservant who fornicated, and promised to have them married by an Englishman, which thing they did not understand, being brought up in Wales. There were undoubtedly much more serious trials. People were sentenced to death here by the cathedral court. But nowadays, although an ecclesiastical court is still held, you'll be relieved to know that this room is no longer a chamber of fear for those who enter. You've now reached the end of this tour, and we hope you've enjoyed it. Please leave the consistory court via the stone steps, 
don't forget to visit the cathedral shop in the Undercroft and the refectory where refreshments are served in the monk's old dining room. Goodbye and God bless. Thank you.